Welcome to Things You Don't Know. Today, we will take a look at Thanksgiving, an iconic holiday that started in North America and has been adopted by many nations. Some nations you might not even think about, like, say, Ukraine. I've had many contacts from, from that country in around this time of year, they all want my recipes for making turkey and uh, cranberry sauce. And I always give it to them because uh, they're good people. We have been taught an abbreviated and less than truthful mythology about how Thanksgiving got started. And virtually nothing about the bloodshed before and after the original gathering between the settlers at Plymouth and their allies from the Wampanoag uh, tribe in 1621, celebrating the settlers' first harvest, which, by the way, they wouldn't have had if the Native Americans hadn't taught them how to farm and preserve their crops. Anyhow, there is much that is dark and even horrific concerning the roots of Thanksgiving. However, it is wise to remember that harvest celebrations have been a part of many cultures long before the pilgrims. Remembering the truth about the roots of this American celebration is important. Taking the time to celebrate with friends and family is also valuable. In, in elementary school, most of us probably learned that the English religious exiles called Puritans began establishing civilization in what they called the New World winning over the local indigenous people already living there with promises of their friendship. Then the Native Americans taught the new arrivals how to grow crops to sustain their growing society, and everybody lived happily ever after. <laughs> well, not quite. The real story, as with many things in history, is far more complicated, not to mention a lot less kid-friendly. The peace that brought the Wampanoag and the settlers together at that historic table wasn't so easy to come by as we'd like to believe. A lot of bloodshed took place both before and after that first feast, and the mistreatment of Native Americans, unfortunately, continues to this day. That is why many Native Americans and other indigenous peoples Mark Thanksgiving as a solemn day of remembrance instead of a celebration. You know, at least 90 Native men and 50 Englishmen came to the feast. Now, the Native people, they dined sitting on the ground, just as they did at home. And the English ate at the table as, as they did at their homes. The settlers were about 25 men, 27, or around that number, teens and children, and four women. Most of the women died on the trip over, and others, you know, for whatever reasons. The group, when they first got together, they, they probably played some marksmanship games and ran foot races in between dining on venison, yum yum geese yum yum turkey and other fowl fish and vegetables from the new crop the festivities lasted three days since it took the wampanoag a solid two days to walk there a wampanoag leader named massasoit first negotiated a treaty between the plymouth settlers and the wampanoag tribe in 1620 which included a solemn agreement that no member of either group would harm anyone from the other. They also pledged to leave their weapons at home when trading to further ensure peaceful commerce. For about 10 years, Massasoit and the pilgrims remained allies, trading English goods to weapon on access to natural resources, land, and other assets. But after Massasoit passed away in 1661 and his son, Wam Sutter, took over, tensions really began to simmer. 
In the years between 1630 and 1642 alone, about 25,000 European colonizers arrived, while a devastating plague decimated the native population by more than half. Amsada himself died mysteriously in 1662 while visiting the Puritans to talk over the gathering unrest between the two groups, the Atlas Obscura reports. His successor, Metacomet, only fanned the flames. You know, it's it's interesting, and we'll get into this a little bit more as we go, but one of the things that is true, the Native Americans and very few other cultures in the East, yes, and, and perhaps the Norse too, were very fastidious about personal hygiene. Europeans, on the other hand, stunk. They bathed, what did you say, uh, Dr. Deneen, like two or three times a year? At best. So I can imagine the odor was almost unbearable. Well, and also they were just breeding grounds for all kinds of disease. So it is no wonder that Native Americans who didn't have immunity to these things died off in amazing numbers. Anyhow, getting back to our storyline. In 1675, three natives were executed after killing a man who had served as a translator to the settlers, which only further engendered distrust between the two groups. Metacomet feared the natives would lose more land to the new arrivals, and he was right, and built a coalition of various native tribes to protect themselves and their resources. By the autumn of 1675, the coalition members began to clash with settlers, attacking settlements in Connecticut and Massachusetts. The Narragansett tribe originally wanted to remain neutral, but they wouldn't give up the Wampanoag who had taken refuge in their encampment, or nor would they turn away women, children, and the elderly or the infirm from that tribe who came to them seeking shelter from the conflict. As a result, the Puritans attacked the Narragansett stronghold, killing up to 600 natives and about 150 settlers in the bloody battle and its aftermath. It's very important to remember, friends, that Native Americans like Afghans and many groups in Africa have a tradition, even to this day, of sanctuary. If you seek their protection, you won't be given up under any circumstances. What was later known as King Philip's War, that's what this war was called. It was named after Metacomet's English moniker. The subsequent conflicts deeply impacted both the native tribes and the white colonists. Mapanong abducted settlers and held them for ransom, while settlers pillaged, destroyed native villages, and raped indigenous women. Much of the colonies were burned and looted, taking decades to fully recover. An article in the Historical Journal of Massachusetts said the war could have claimed as many as 30% of the English-speaking population and half the Native Americans then living in what's now known as New England. The war officially ended when Metacomet was killed, beheaded, and dismembered, according to the colonial history that happened in Rhode Island. His remaining allies were executed or sold into slavery in the West Indies. The colonists impaled what they called King Philip's head on a spike and displayed it in Plymouth for the next 25 years as a macabre effigy to the strife. The formation of Thanksgiving as an official United States holiday did not begin until November 1863, during the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln officially established the holiday as a way to improve relations between northern and southern states, haha, as well as the U.S. and tribal nations. Just a year prior, a mass execution took place of Dakota tribal members. Now, what happened is corrupt federal agents kept the Dakota 
sue from receiving food and provisions. So at the brink of death and starvation, members of the tribe fought back. So would I. Resulting in the Dakota War of 1862. So Lincoln, in his inimitable style, ordered 38 Dakota men to die from hanging. And he felt that Thanksgiving offered an opportunity to bridge the hard feelings amongst natives and the federal government. Look, there's a guy named uh, Dr. Mosteller, and he says it was propaganda. I agree with him. It was to try and build this event so that you could have a deeper narrative about community building and coming together in shared brotherhood and unity. Ha, ha, ha. It's one of the ironies of history that the commander of the U.S. forces who had engaged in slaughtering the Dakota and the Sioux was John Pope, a former Union Army commander who had been thoroughly licked by General T.J. Jackson, 2nd Manassas. Well, the Thanksgiving today, as we celebrate it, may not have complete factual roots. It's important to remember that Native Americans, Europeans, and other cultures across the world have held special meals in gratitude for bountiful harvests, festivals, and simply to reflect on the past year. Many across what was known as Indian country continue these traditions by sharing a meal with friends and loved ones without referencing it as a true Thanksgiving. A lot of people don't acknowledge it as Thanksgiving. They say, I'm going to get together with my family. It's going to be about sharing this meal. We are not going to acknowledge the Mayflower and the Pilgrims because it is holding up this false moment of friendship and completely disregards what Dr. Mosteller calls the genocide and the mass land theft, as well as the brutality that all Native peoples experienced. Prior to the arrival of Europeans, indigenous peoples did not experience large-scale illnesses attributed to livestock or hygiene or overcrowding. Residents of Northern Europe and the UK rarely bathed, believing it unhealthy, and rarely removed all of their clothing at any time, believing it to be unmodest, Dr. Charles Lowton wrote in Lies My Teacher Told Me. The pilgrims smell bad to the Indians, probably would have to me too. Squanto uh, tr tried without success to teach them to bathe, <laughs> according to his uh, biographer, uh, Feeney Zinner. Uh, in fact, three years before the pilgrims landed, English and French fishermen transmitted diseases to tribes as they came ashore to find fresh water, firewood, and, and also this little nice thing of capturing Native Americans for the slave trade. You know, we never hear about that. We only hear about African Americans being forced into the slave trade. But this heinous, absolutely reprehensible thing happened to Native Americans also. So within three years, the plague wiped out between 90 to 96 percent of the inhabitants of coastal New England. Native societies were devastated. Only the 20th person scarce still alive, wrote uh, Robert Cushman, an English uh, eyewitness, uh, according to a death rate, re recording a death rate unknown in all previous experience, human experience. And still, I think it is greater. I, if, if, um, if Hitler had killed 90% of the Jews, I, I mean, I mean, the guy was a nut and a, and a criminal. Yes. But so were we. Those who did survive left their communities to join others, bringing the illnesses along with them. This caused many Native Americans to perish, even though they had not encountered Europeans. Once the pilgrims did arrive in 1620, the epidemics 
across what's called Indian country. We're far from over. Throughout history, religion has served as a means of justification for the English separatists. That wasn't any different. They believed, you know, get this, okay. They believed the widespread death and devastation of Native Americans due to disease was divine providence. And that God willed them to take over the land. That's not any God that I'm, like, very happy with. I don't believe that. Me either. By the time the native populations of New England had replenished themselves to some degree, it was too late to expel the intruders. If colonists had not been able to occupy lands already cleared by Indian farmers who had vanished, colonization would have proceeded much more slowly. If Indian culture had not been devastated by the physical and psychological assaults it had suffered, colonization may not have proceeded at all, Lowen writes. The story of Squanto, a member of the Wapanong tribe, is much less innocent than the narrative that he assisted the pilgrims by teaching them how to grow crops and take advantage of North America's bounty. You know, six years before the Mayflower arrived in present-day Massachusetts, a slave trader captured Squanto. Actually, his name is Disquantum. And a group of Native Americans with help from the Catholic Church, Tisquantum escaped and found his way to England, where he learned English. He eventually turned, returned to North America in 1619. Now, while Tisquantum was overseas, New England's indigenous peoples experienced a monumental death rate, with some communities losing nearly every tribal member to the decimating effects of European diseases. Now, when Tisquantum returned to North America and to his village of uh, Patasset, Tisquantum found only piles of bones of his fellow tribesmen killed by the plagues. He realized he was the sole survivor of his village. The illness spread so quickly that many local tribes never had time to bury their dead. Where Tisquantum's village once thrived, the pilgrims established Plymouth Plantation. And during this time, the Wampanoag lost up to 75% of its people, while its nearby enemy tribe, the Narragansett, did not. Wampanoag leader Massasoit saw the pilgrims as possible allies against the Narragansett. Due to his abilities in speaking English, Massasoit used his quantum as a translator, although the Wampanoag leader did not trust his fellow tribesmen and held him as a prisoner. Rather than continue a life of servitude to Massasoit, the Squantum established himself as a key resource to the pilgrims teaching them how to survive. Wampanoag and the pilgrims made a treaty that established an understanding the tribes would look out for the pilgrims against their enemies and vice versa. Squanto's travels acquainted him with more of the world than any pilgrim had encountered. He had crossed the Atlantic at least perhaps six times, twice as an English captive, and had lived in Maine, Newfoundland, Spain, and England, as well as Massachusetts. All of this brings us to Thanksgiving, Lowen wrote, and lies my teacher told me, this prompted the foundation of the National Day of Mourning. The pilgrims celebrated their successful harvest in 1621 by shooting their guns into the air. <laughs> okay. This caused Massasoit to bring together warriors and prepare for battle. So when he, when he discovered that hey, these cookies are just celebrating so instead of fighting, the Wampanoag and the pilgrims worked together to prepare a feast. It was sort of an on-the-spur-of-the-moment kind of deal. In an article published by Indian Country Today in 2011, Thanksgiving Day is a time uh, of grief for Native Americans. Uh, it was said in that article. 
Many natives continue to gather at Coles Hill near Plymouth Rock and remember the losses experienced for the past 400 plus years through the National Day of Mourning. The event began in 1970 when the Commonwealth of Massachusetts invited Wamsutta, Frank James, to address the public on behalf of the Wampanoag people. However, once organizers learned the subject of his speech, which included highlighting the death and broken promises at the hand of settlers, colonial powers, and the United States, James was no longer included and no longer gave the speech. He did write that this action by Massasoit was perhaps our biggest mistake. We, the Wampanoag, welcomed you, the white man, with open arms, little knowing that it was the beginning of the end. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you found some interesting, although perhaps disturbing, facts about the roots of Thanksgiving. Despite the gruesome facts, celebrating what we have and sharing goodwill with those we care about and those we don't even know is a good thing. Wish to wish you a happy Thanksgiving. When I was a child, one of my family's tradition, and you don't even know this, Dr. Levine, was that one of us was one of our one of the kids. One of us kids was supposed to go out and find somebody who looked like they were hungry or didn't have a place to be. And they came and joined us for Thanksgiving dinner. I miss that. How beautiful. Yeah. Listen, the journey of this podcast has been interesting, to say the least. I just want to express my gratitude. I'm so thankful for all the things that we have uncovered and have been able to present to our listeners. We have met so many wonderful people along the way, and the spirits of those people is engraved on my heart, along with my gratitude to them. Mine as well. I wish to express my deep gratitude and respect to all of our listeners, to you, Dr. Weaver, and the many wonderful people who have participated with us. It's been a joy and enlightenment to create these 66 podcasts. Many more are coming. I wish to just say very briefly, we trust our listeners, so we're going to expose what we know. We trust them to make up their own minds. We don't sugarcoat things. We don't hide differences of opinion or unpleasant realities. As a historian, I have an obligation to put the facts out there the best way I can and trust the intelligence of the people who learn them. You know, Dr. Neen, that's one of the things I admire and respect about you. And people, this guy I'm working with, the dude is like wild, crazy, great in knowing uh, so much about history. In fact, I kind of play with him at times and I'll, I'll come up with something and say, do you know anything about that? And ding dong it, he always does. <laughs> he may not know everything about it, but he knows a lot about it. And I, he's amazing. Um, anyhow, before we go, I want to let you know a bit about some upcoming projects. I'm really excited about some of this. We are in the final preparations for a podcast featuring an amazing young man, Zachary Vasquez, in which we will explore some myths about the very exceptionalities community. We're also in the final preparations for presenting our original research on the exceptionalities community. We have responses from people around the world to a questionnaire, and we are excited to bring that information to our listeners. It's taken a long time to put this information together in a way that did justice to the topic and to our contributors. And another goodie. We're in the final stages of kicking off our new podcast series, History Twists, which is an alternate history venture. We'll be covering some largely overlooked topics in that podcast. The first presentation, just to give you a little idea here, we'll be looking at a what if. What if the Norse 
had stayed and traveled further south and met up with the Powhatans in the 1100s. Man, what we have uncovered and the, the research that we did, we're not just sort of, you know, doing a lolly lolly uh, fantasy thing because, you know, Dr. Deneen wouldn't allow me to do that, I'm sure. Um, and I wouldn't want to either. Oh, don't forget also our other History Twist podcast, which I'm going to interview Dr. Weaver about your wonderful new novel, which concerns Native Americans unifying and going from fighting off the European settlers, establishing their own country, to going to the moon and beyond. It's a combination of science fiction, Native American culture, and alternative history. I tell you, folks, you all will want to tune into that one. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. And I am looking forward to to bringing that to people. Hey, we're going to uh, uh, let you go for now. Um, but I really do appreciate you joining us and joining us for all of the uh, podcasts. Do us a favor. Please give us a like. Do it while you're thinking about it right now. Also, you know that little reminder bell? Click on that so that uh, you'll be kept informed about you know, what we're doing and that sort of thing. And, you know, be aware that we're not like a lot of people. We're not, you know, reaping tons of money or anything like that. So your comments and your support and your likes is kind of what keeps us going as much as the idea of bringing things to people's attention. Sure does, folks. It's a lot of hard work, but a lot of fun. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> and yes, yes, indeed. Take care. Bye for now.